Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 283 for Monday, December 7th, 2020. folks and welcome to gig gab the show by for and about working musicians as always here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton you're in napomo california it's paul kent it's amazing mr kent today i am wearing a hat a winter hat like a you know a, a little knit hat that actually that my wife made for me and i have that over my uh it's these old west tone um2s these in-ears that i always use when i do the show and it's amazing how Doing that, even though these things are seal fully in my ears and don't have, you know, any sort of external like ports or anything, having the hat on over them changes the sound in a way that is remarkable. I, I mean, it's, it still sounds good. In fact, in a way, it sounds better. It's, it's like a much tighter, warmer thing. I don't know why, but, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. It's crazy. Like I, I notice on stage, if I have a, a hat on with a brim, it changes the way I hear my microphone. Um, you know, if I wonder if, if it's a body chemistry thing that you're you're retaining heat through your head, yeah. And therefore, your your you know your relationship of your ears or the or the or the shape of your ears due to the body heat, you know, changes to the to the seal of the. Uh, it could uh, be, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 but it, right, it it like it's these little things make such huge differences. Um, you know, and I notice, like, you know, I I've been known to wear a onesie on stage at times, and sometimes <laughs> those come with with you know, like the the big hood or whatever, and that changes things. It's I have no scientific answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, had, I could I could wing something, but the onesie you're on your own. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just interesting, you know. As as we started talking here, I was like, oh wow, things really sound like warmer, tighter. It's interesting. I don't know. It's just, I mean, it, it it makes sense that changing, you know, the the physical relationship of things to your head. Maybe it's just pushing these things ever so slightly in my ears. Cause there's pressure on the outside of them. Right. And they're not, yeah. you know, like it could be any of these things and it's just, it's interesting. So I, I, you know, I'm a, I, I, I notice these things. And so I, I point them out. Why not? It's, it's what we do. We're a hat and yeah. a onesie and a onesie both at the same time. <laughs> oh, it can be great. <laughs> It'd be nice. if Someone could stitch a hat into a onesie. Oh, don't tempt people, man. Gosh. Flap, flap that over the back, you know, <laughs> of your neck. And... I like it. I Fashions like it. By yes, that's right. There you go. Uh, hey, dude, guess what? Hey, what? I played a gig last week. It was Woo! remarkably awesome. Yeah. Hey, that's great. So, Where did you play? What What was well, the It's a cool story. So the yeah. deal is um, I've made a friend down here and uh, who's a musician, who's a working musician down here. And I said, hey, can we go out for a nice socially distant lunch? And, you know, I just want to ask you about the scene and, you know, where to meet people and what are good places for me to reach out for and, yeah. you know, bounce a couple of the projects that I'm interested in off of them. And so we went and we had a nice lunch and I, and he was like, you do a solo acoustic thing. And I said, yeah, he goes, you know, right down the street here is a good place for that. You know, I have played there. Why don't we just walk down and see if the owner's there? So we did. Knocked on the door, went inside. Owner was there. Nice conversation. Good guy. Interesting cat. And uh, he goes, so when do you want to play? And I said, when do you want me to play? He goes, how about tomorrow? Wow. <laughs> so, and so it turned into a gig. So Friday night at a restaurant in Pismo Beach, I played a gig and uh, solo acoustic uh, on an outdoor patio. It was nice and socially distanced. They set up a nice little area for me, with a little backdrop, you know, a couple tables. The staff was really, really nice and said, well, we're so appreciative. It turns out it's it, I'm probably the second to last because we've gone back into this stay at home order here oh that's right uh, that kind of starts today or, or yes, this week exactly. or something right right and uh you know the thing was he said you know I'm, I, I we're not doing much business i don't have a whole lot of budget for for, for music right now i said you know it, you know if you have an interest in you know let me do my thing and maybe doing some more how about this do what you can and i'll you know mostly do it for tips yep he goes, yeah, you know, he goes, I, you know, we have music here. And so I don't want to, I don't want to, and I knew this, um, you know, I, I will do what I can depending on how we do it at the end of the night. Sure. And which, which, which I was fine with. Yep. And, um, yep. Yep. 
Well, I mean, these yeah, are, please. yeah. It, it, well, g- keep going because there's a, there's a conversation to have there, but, but keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, I, and I had said this to the guy and remember I'm the, I'm the music has value guy, but I also am realistic that, you know, I'm also the new guy in town and, yeah. you know, demos and whatever. And there's a long list of, of guys who have paid dues in this town, you know, who, who want a gig. Anyway, uh, I, I told some friends, but actually I only told them as a courtesy because I figured the few friends I have down here, you know, I didn't want them to feel obligated to come out if they didn't feel it was safe. Right. But I also didn't want them to hear that I played something and, you know, didn't tell them about it. So I just <laughs> said, hey. That's a weird, no yeah, that's a weird balancing act. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no yeah. pressure. I just w- didn't want you to hear from someone else that I did this, but I'm playing. Well, sure enough, a nice group showed up that really added to his draw. I had a great time. The vibe was really nice. It was, you know, the staff was great. Um, the beer was great. And I played about two and a quarter hours straight, which he was really surprised about. He said, you know, most people take a break. I said, you know what? I'm just having a good time. Let me just kind of run through this. And he was cool. And uh, it was a good tip night. It was a good match of his kind of built-in audience because he's been there for a little bit. Sure. Um, and the people who came out to see me, which was a good start. And good tip night. He added a little bit to the end. So I made some money. I had a great time. It was actually very cathartic and very emotional to do it. It was, it, you know, I don't know whether I would want the first thing to channel that catharsis, you know, an emotion into my band, but, you know, I, I had a chance to do something. So I kind of, yeah. as long as it was safe, I jumped at it and I went out and, and, uh, it was great. I played, you know, there are a couple of requests that I was able to do, you know, they were feeling pretty good at the end of the night. We did a couple of sing-alongs at the end of the night. They got into, paid attention to some of the quieter stuff. It was really, really nice. That's I mean, great, was, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the opportunity cool. to apply your craft, but also just the opportunity to play and, and enjoy the sound of other people applauding. Like there's, That's there's it. something, yeah, there's something to be said for that. That's great. That's great. I'm glad to hear that, man. That's good. I assume uh, the, the restaurant was able to keep people, you know, as safe as they wanted to be and all of that stuff too. Was, uh, yeah. It was outdoor patio oh, and, oh. Um, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of, you know, a couple of tables that would accommodate a party of six, which I think is the largest you're technically allowed to have. And then, um, and then, you know, some tables of two and they, and they sure. were, and there was probably 40 people there. And That's great. Um, yeah, I, I felt safe. Um, uh, the only thing that got a moment of pause was uh, I played me and Julio down by the schoolyard and the owner wanted to do the, um, wanted to do the whistling the, the solo. whistle solo of course yeah so he came with a mask he did his whistle solo into my mic and Ooh. you know that, that was okay yeah that's yeah that's one of those dicey moments though it's like oh what do you do yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's tough that's tough if you had known ahead of time you could have set up a separate mic for him go over yeah, there exactly. whistle that way exactly. yeah. over there over next there. door oh next door <laughs> take this with you perhaps throw it away when you're done it's fine it's, wire- it's wireless it's wireless yeah. it's yours you win <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah it was cool to kind of get back in the game and you know now i have a first gig down here and he was really happy he said we'll do more yeah you know so when things open up again you know there's a chance to do some things and and uh mostly that you know that process of networking remember this all started with a lunch well that's that the I key to with a guy I, I, that's yeah. kind of where i wanted to circle back to for people was look you know you are the new guy in town it is a pandemic and yet by doing the things that we always talk about doing, like the fundamentals, you you know, you always refer to it as blocking and tackling. Like it, this is just the stuff that you do. And it doesn't always turn into a, do you want to play tomorrow night uh, conversation? In fact, very rarely does that happen, but it can happen. And it definitely would not have happened for you if you hadn't gone and done the blocking and tackling the, you know, just the fundamentals of introducing yourself to people being a nice guy, being flexible and being able to fill a spot for him, which was great. Yeah. 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 The conversation about the scene was, it was interesting in that it was very similar to probably every other scene with a few unique twists. Um, uh, I have noticed that there's less like up in the Bay area. If you wanted to work, you pretty much had to get people dancing in most of the types of gigs that there were certainly in, certainly in clubs, uh, that were dance clubs sure, and certainly the festivals, they want draws. And so it's, you know, it's kind of a universal, can you bring a crowd? That's one check in your list. And, you know, can you get people up and keep them up? You know, that's the next check in your list. And so the guy I had lunch with was good. He plays in a band that does something kind of interesting. They're like a five piece 
kind of a swing group. You know, they they kind of do swing adaptations of yeah. a lot of popular things. And I was saying it does seem like there's a little bit of a unique um, tolerance to different types of music down here. He goes, yeah, I would say that, you know, you're you're going to hear, you know, a lot more kind of like country or Americana stuff. And there are audiences and venues for that. Uh, you know, it's a college town, so there's, you know, certain types of music. Like, there's oddly seems to be quite a bit of reggae down here, right? Interesting. In, in Central yeah. California coast. Yeah. Not that much reggae up in Northern California where I was. Um, he said, you know, there's a and thousand now, dad bands playing the same classic rock stuff. And that, you know, and there's actually not, there's not any dance clubs down here. So there's not as many places for that. There's a pretty healthy outdoor festival you know, a concert series vibe down here. Well, and Pismo that, Beach, I didn't realize how close you were to Pismo Beach. I've yeah. I've heard of that as a vacation destination where people go, yeah. right? So so you've got tourism traffic all summer long, which is different yeah, so there, for there you than in of, the Bay Area, right? Yeah, I mean, there are a bunch yeah. of resort type places yeah. up and down the beach that, uh, that do music. That'll be kind of interesting. Well, but, the nice part about that is you you could get a standing gig at one of these places. You know, you play every Friday night. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying this is what you want to do, but if you live near a tourist place, it can, you can go have, you can have the same band every Friday night because they bring in their own new crowd. Right. Yeah. And, and that can work really well. I mean, I've done that down in Hampton beach uh, at, at a couple of clubs, you know, with different bands, but where it's like, oh yeah, you know, we have eight gigs at that one place over the summer. And at first it's like, that sounds crazy. Why do we, we want to do that? And it's like, oh, right. They're different people. We get to stay here. You change. That's great. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And which is very, uh, uh, opposite to the way that I've always, you know, I've always thought right. you have to have a local presence, you know, and do a lot of stuff locally. So you're always bringing 20, 40, 50 people to something that you do. And um, this is a little bit different than, although I'm sure, you know, having a local presence and adding to whatever the tourist thing. Doesn't although hurt. Typically, yeah, I but think the locals happens, like to the locals avoid. Locals don't want. Yes, exactly. Right. You will. Yes. I, I, yeah. Whenever we play Hampton Beach, and I mention that to our, you know, our local f crowds or, or family and friends or whatever, they're always like, oh, yeah, I don't know. You know, because, <laughs> well, because it's just a different pace of life. The gigs start later. Parking is kind of a mess because most of the people are already there and parked. And, you know, it's not built for you to come in from somewhere close by and then leave. It's built right. for people that have a hotel room. And and so it's just a different pace of things. Gigs tend to start a little bit later, I've found. Although there's, you know, the early like happy hour thing. And then there's the late like sweaty rock gigs. Um, but but you got to leave these places time to sell food because that's where they make a lot of money uh, because everybody is eating out. It's not like, oh, you come to the club and eat here. No, 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 no. You sell food. Right. Then it becomes a. So, yeah, it, it's a. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's that's interesting. That's it could be a good thing. I mean, it I, like if, if you want to leverage that, that's a great little opportunity. So that's good, man. Yeah, that's you great. Know, and I was also being aware, you know, there, there are the typical like most scene have clicks, you know, there's the, of there's course. the kind of the A-list guys. There's kind of the, the um, younger guys, you know, there's the old dad band guys. There's a, you know, not, there's not like a, a vibrant corporate scene here. Cause there's not a lot of business, you know, corporations down here. So there's not that type of scene mm. like there is in San Francisco, you know, or, or most major cities have those corporate event bands, but, and there's one or two that, you know, go for it. A lot of wedding work. Cause there's a lot of weddings down here, but, you know, finding how to, take my last 22 years of experiences and approach and, and mapping it to what will happen here. You know, you kind of go back and forth between, well, listen, I'm just going to do my thing and, you know, let's see how it works out. Mm. Or do you say, open my eyes and, you know, it's different here, you know, approach your business a little bit differently. So just trying to feel it out. But, you know, a couple of people took cards on Friday night and, and uh, like I said, I have one owner who's, who's, you know, pretty happy. And I'm, I imagine I'll get invited back there when things open up and, I'm just happy that it's a start, man. It was that's great. I was yeah. I, was I mean, so crazy. So much in your way here. You moved. You it's a pandemic. Like you had yeah. all this stuff, and and you make it happen. That's great. Congratulations. I'm that's Dang. I'm so happy. That's awesome. That's it awesome. Was awesome. That's Thank great. You, yeah, man. That's good. What's going on with you these days? Um, you know, uh, gigs have slowed down. Uh, stopped basically. Uh, Is it cold. Oh yeah. I'm wearing a hat, man. You know, you telling me you're playing outside <laughs> sounds crazy to me. It's like 30 degrees outside here. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of that, that, well, the, the, 
very predictable slowdown. We, I'm very excited though. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think I mentioned we went down to uh, a place called Haunted Overload, which is one of the you know top ten, if not top number one, haunted trails experiences uh, in the country, and it happens to be in our our neck of the woods here. And we went down there as Bitter, Bitter Pill went down there and we recorded a video for uh, one of our songs called Cond. And I the video comes out a week from today on the 14th, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. I'll put a link in the You'll show. Share notes. it on the site, right? Yeah. And I, I've gotten to see it, of course. And oh, man, it's like I am so excited about how this came out. It's so good. So, yeah, very cool. We, we worked with a, a filmmaker named, uh, Bob, I was going to say his brother's name. But, uh, but Harry McCoy is the filmmaker, his brother, Tim McCoy is a bass player, but, um, mm-hmm. Harry McCoy, this filmmaker put this together for us and worked with us on it. And man, he did a killer job. So it's so good. So good. So I'm excited that, you know, there's, there are things you can do and, and mm-hmm. we are doing them. So by hook or by crook. So Beautiful. yeah, it's this, good. This video that you made, it was like full on professional lights, professional, we, we make up. Uh, yes. And, but no lights. It, it, we did it in the, we did it outdoors in the daytime and used the available light. And it it was, it, that was the intention. We planned it so that we were there right when the light would be perfect for us to, to film this thing. And how it, long, how long were you, did it take to, how many takes of the song did you have to do? We probably did, man. Um, I would say we probably did we played the song through maybe 10 times, let's say, um, you know, we, he, he would just play it on a little Bluetooth speaker and, and, you know, start filming. And then we would play along with it and sing along with it. And he took, you know, probably five shots through of the band from like distant angles. And mm-hmm. then another five shots where he was like setting up close ups on different people. And then we, and then we did some other little kitschy things that you'll see in the video as well. But, but yeah, it was probably, it was probably 10 times through when all was said and done. And it, Very cool. yeah, it, you know, t- we were there a couple hours, three hours, maybe, um, you know, just got set up and, and went, but you know, Harry knew he's worked at haunted overload for years and years. So he knew exactly what we were going to be doing. The, the, the interesting part was this place that we were set up, which, which we used as the, as the stage is part of a building that's been at haunted overload forever. And the day after we filmed there, that building was being taken down. Uh, and so, and it, it needed to come down because where you see us standing on stage, Mike, our banjo player and I were standing on the joists because when we stood between the joists, we fell down and that wasn't so good. Yeah. So we, we opted not to keep doing that. So for the director's cut for the outtake. Reel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like we're, we were so careful in getting up and like making sure everything was okay. And then as I was getting off this thing, you know, once we were finally done filming, I fell through it at the, at the front of it. And Harry was right there. And obviously he's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. He's like, well, that one's your fault. You knew better by now. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, you know, it, but it's what happens. You have like a bunch of stuff in your hands. You you stop thinking about the one thing that you need to think about. And then suddenly you step in the wrong spot and boom, you know? Right. Yep. But I mean, I was fine. It, you know, I didn't get hurt or anything, but it was just one of those. Oh, here I go. Uh, mm-hmm. Yep. So, but it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm really stoked. Uh, for this video. So that'll be, that'll be next week. Yep. Very excited. We have our gift guide to go through, which will be a little bit different than I thought it would be simply because y'all sent in some questions to feedback at giggabpodcast.com that fit perfectly into this uh, gift guide thing. So I'm really excited to do that. I'm also really excited to tell you about our sponsor, which is better help at betterhelp.com slash giggab. Look, 2020 is stressful enough as it is. There's other stuff that goes on too, you know, things that interfere with our happiness and prevent us from achieving our goals. And BetterHelp will assist us by matching our needs with our own licensed professional therapist. And then the best part here is we get to connect 
in a safe and private online environment. So we get to avoid the stress of going and sitting in a waiting room before we get to talk to somebody about what's bothering us, right? Like we, that these days, that for me, that would add to my stress. That's not what I need. And this is why I love better help because you do this online. You can do it on the phone or, you know, on your computer, you can do it audio or video, whatever works for you. Uh, Probably in most cases, you can start communicating in under 24 hours and it's not self-help. It is truly professional counseling. You can send a message to your counselor at any time and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses from them. And BetterHelp is committed to facilitating a great therapeutic match so they make it easy and free to change counselors if you ever need to. And of course, their licensed professional counselors specialize in things like depression, stress and anxiety and uh, grief and self-esteem issues, sleep issues. And obviously, anything you share is confidential. So we want you to start living a happier life today. And as a Gig Gab listener, you get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash gig gab. Join over a million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash gig gab. And our thanks to BetterHelp for doing what they're doing and for sponsoring this episode. All right, man. Well, it's time, I think, Paul, to get to this <laughs> wish list. Should we start? Do you have a Do you have a thing you want to start with, or should I just start with someone's question that came in, and and we'll go from there? Yeah, go ahead. Let's take care of the listeners first. All right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, uh, Jason emailed us, and Jason it said, uh, "I am looking for recommendations for mounting an iPad Mini to a mic stand." For FaceTime drum lessons. Uh, but of course, really what we're talking about is mounting an iPad to a mic stand. It doesn't really matter what you're using it for. Uh, it says it needs to articulate a little so I can set the angle right, but it has to be strong and hold the angle. He's, it, and it, for him, he says it's for his 10-year-old son who's taking drum lessons and he wants to mount an iPad mini or two securely to a mic stand for these FaceTimes with his instructor. So, great. Okay. Well... I, and, and the best part about this was when Jason wrote, he didn't think that something like this existed. And the best part is it totally exists because you have to look yeah. no further than the stage ninja stuff. Their tablet mount with the clamp base is what I use for this. And I, quite frankly, I couldn't live without this. I, I, they Their stuff is fantastic. And, you know, Jason's question about it needs to articulate a little, but it needs to be strong. Couldn't possibly have described the stage ninja better. It has what they call their scorpion clamp, which really does that. If you grab it and move it, it will move. And when you let go, it stops and it stays there. So That's you've cool. used their stuff, right? The stage ninja no. stuff. Oh, really? No. Oh, dude. Yeah. It's the way to go. I I need to get another one. I I beat mine up too much. And it they these things do take quite a beating, but I've, you know, I, I think I've gone a little overboard on mine. Um and I've had it for five years or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you've talked about it before. You yeah. about this stuff. Yeah, so it is in my it is on my wish list because I want another one, <laughs> but it is a great thing to have for uh, for all of us. So so there you go. Yeah, stocking stuffer. Yeah, it'd be a little big for the stocking, but you know that's all right. You shove it in there. Yeah, it's fine. There you, go. you could hang your stocking with this thing. Is really what you could do. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's good marketing. <laughs> that's a stocking hanger, is what it is. <laughs> that's funny. All, all right, right, my yeah, go ahead. My first thing on my uh, Christmas list. I am fascinated by this um, positive grid spark guitar amp. It's a, it's a kind of a practice size amp that is largely controlled through an app. Uh, you know, one of the things that models dozens of amps, dozens of pedals, and you can, you know, al align the signal chain in a lot of different ways. It's a ridiculously good price point. I don't get it. It's a 40 watt amp and it's gotten really, really good reviews. And, um, you know, for the home, uh, the form factor of it looks like it looks perfect. It's not the size of a of a of a normal amp, um, so it can make some noise at forty watts. But um, just the ability to play with signal chains, dial some things in, use it as a recording tool. I just think all of it sounds great. And then there's a lot of like you know jam along tracks, and you know there's there's some educational components of it as well for people who are beginners. But just the utility of it is looks awesome to me. And all the reviews I've read have been really, really positive about it. You know, there's nine out of 10 reviews, 95 out of 100 reviews. Uh, so the um, Spark Guitar Amp by Positive Grid would be 
my number one thing on my Christmas list this year. Wow. And 239 bucks is what it says, at yeah. least on their website. Exactly. That's, it's on 60 bucks off now. That's crazy. Look at that thing. And you see can, how the form of it is like, you can just put it on a desktop. You can yeah, put it. It, it, it looks, looks like the size of like an amp head. It's, it's what it looks like, right? It's, it's yeah. yeah interesting. Wow. That's huh. And you get to tweak your, oh, you do all kinds of things with this. Wow. Yeah. And jam along tracks if you want. Yeah. Just work on your chops. And, and, uh, but mostly it's the sound tweaking that is of interest to me. I mean, right. You know, to be able to basically call up Marshall Fender Vox, you know, sounds and start from there and layering things on, it just, it just looks like, it looks like a lot of solutions in one small, really reasonably priced package. Yeah, it. I mean, it, like, like you said, like the the price makes me go. Well, how, well, how okay? How does this work? Exactly. Like, but but it, it, at that price, it's totally worth figuring out. And like, how do we, how do we make it work? That's great. That's awesome. I like yeah. it. That's good, man. That's good. <sighs> All right. Well, the next one is uh, a question from Andy, and uh, he says. Uh, Dave, since you're such an audio, great audio guy for drums, well, I'm an audio guy for drums. I'm forced to do it. He <laughs> says, I thought, I, I thought I'd run my, run my gear purchase by you and see if you wanted to chime in with your opinion. I need to buy a set of drum kit mics to be used solely for live playing through a PA, at least initially. Perhaps I may graduate to recording at home, but I currently have other studio options to do that if necessary. The gigs are a variety of bar gigs, outdoor private parties, outside company events, and smaller festivals and parts, parks, etc. I currently only use a low-cost, off-brand bass drum mic and run that through the PA. It works just fine for most of the indoor gigs we play in smaller venues. Some larger venues and outside gigs have their own PA and drum mics set up. But more often recently, I'm playing outside gigs, only the band's PA system and just my bass drum mic. And on those gigs, the rest of my kit is lost in the mix. And he says, I have to play harder and I'm beat tired. It's time to get a basic mic set up for your kit. Yeah, absolutely. You shouldn't be overplaying uh, just to be heard at all. That that can that can be a bad thing for a lot of reasons. Yeah, but you're heading down the right path. So he says, I need to keep it reasonable. Let's say under a grand with everything. After some research and asking band members, he says, I've, I'm looking at Shure's DMK 5752 drum mic package, which is a 349 package that has, uh, I believe, four mics in it, a kick, a, 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 50, a 57, oh, 52A, beta 52A, I think, for the kick, and then 357s to be used on toms and or snare. Uh and then he says, um, and then I'll need to get a mixing board because with at least one of the bands I play in, the PA doesn't have enough channels for me to put three more drum mics in. He says, so I'm going to have to submix my drums and then pass that submix up to the, the front of house. And that's a pretty common thing to do. Less and less common these days with digital mixers that just have gobs and gobs of channels, but, but certainly common time-tested thing to do. And he was looking for advice on a mixer as well. So, Let's let's go to the drum mics first. I was in a similar but different scenario when I did my quarantine thing. And I can't believe it's taken us this long to talk about this, Paul. But I wanted to close mic all of my drums. And I'd always sort of cobbled together something over the years whenever I needed to do miking. But, you know, as I was setting up and doing a lot of recording here earlier this year, I thought, well, let me let, let's it's time to spend some money. But the problem was, Paul, I had always looked and seen on Amazon, these, you know, hundred dollar seven piece drum mic sets. Yeah. And, and I thought, you know, I need to know that that's terrible so that I can <laughs> comfortably go spend five, six, 700 bucks on a set of drum mics, you know, because right. if I go, if I start with five, six, seven, I'm always going to wonder, yeah, but what would those hundred dollar mics have sounded like? Like, would I, would I notice a difference? So I did, I bought a set of pile P O P Y L E. I'll put a link in the notes, but they're discontinued. I bought them for 99 bucks. I found a very similar one, which I think is probably exactly the same set from a company called Extuga, uh, the same seven piece set. And now these are sets that come with uh, clamps and everything, like it, basically everything you need uh, except mic cables. And, and I think some of them even come with mic cables. It's crazy. And so I set these pile mics up and uh, you know what? That pile set sounds great. Oh, 
I, I it's, bucks? it's what I've been using. Yes. Seven microphones for 99 bucks. Now I've been using it in the studio. I can get exactly the sound of my drums that I want out of these things. It's amazing. It's uh, truly amazing. And it, but it's not all that surprising, right? Because they're not brand name mics. Nobody's spending any money on marketing here. Are they the most high quality mics I've ever used? Absolutely not. Right. You know, but you can, they're, they're pretty flat EQ. They don't have any real character to them, but they also don't get in the way. They, they send what I need and then I can, you know, season to taste when I, when I'm recording. I don't know that I would, in fact, I will say this. I would never choose to use these in a live setting, however. And the main reason for that is I don't trust the hardware. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's fine set up here in my studio, but if I, you know, loosen and tighten these, these clamps more than a few more times, I don't think that they're going to tighten anymore. <laughs> I think I'm going to lose them. So I, you know, a day may come where it, a gig happens and it's like, oh crap, I have to bring these for whatever reason. Sure. I, you could deal with it, but, uh, but I probably would not lean on these for that kind of scenario. Just based you know, on this brings up a really interesting conversation because the next thing on my list was going to be either a zoom h2n mm -hmm. recorder or the zoom um uh video camera yeah right so zoom q2n 4k right and the reason it's related to what you're saying here is like i love zoom gear you know zoom i have the l8 mixer yep. i have the h6n in recorder yep. and it seems like at the consumer to prosumer level the technology and the electronics to capture audio in a quality format, that price point is way down. Yeah. I don't really know about the, you know, where is the arc of difference? We, you know, you and I got that great relationship with the nice folks at Warm Audio. Sure. And we were able to get some high-end mics, right? Yep. And they sound great. They yep. do sound great. They truly do. But, yeah. But there's this interesting blur of an arc between let's just say 200 and below and the types of things you can get, you know, the types of USB microphones you can get now and the ability to capture audio in an extremely usable fashion. I mean, it's going to get compressed beyond all get up for, for playback on, on Facebook anyway. Sure. Right. You know, that your need for, you know, really, really high end is an interesting question. It you is, know, uh, it is. Yeah. yeah. I, and so it really, for me comes down to, to two things. And I, and there is a third that I'm holding back that I, I will circle back to, but really it's two things. Can I rely on it to work in the scenarios that I need it to work in? Right? Like I cannot get to a gig and wonder if my drum mics are going to work. Just like I can't get to a gig and wonder if my bass drum pedal is going to work. Yes. I bring right. a spare bass drum pedal with me, but if I thought my primary pedal was going to fail, I would get a different primary pedal, right? Like yeah. I cannot have a 50% expectation of it failing. So, you know, what I can, what I can deal with in the studio here is a different type of will it work than what I would deal with, with a gig, you know, where I know that things are going to get hot, things are going to get cold in the car and like, is it going to survive? So that's the build quality and durability, durability is really, for the, yeah. for the scenario. And the studio is very different than gigs. In fact, I have some mic stands in the studio that I bought and I, I intentionally left the tags on them so that the guys in fling would know not to ever remove them from the room. And it was because if we take these to and from gigs, they're good for about three gigs, but mm. set up here in the studio, they're good for like 10 years because we're not right. doing anything. So, so there's that there's durability. And then there is, will it, does it give me the sound that I need it to give me, y you know, and when I'm buying a, a symbol or something, well, that's a very different thing. And a, a inexpensive symbol does not sound like an expensive symbol in most cases, mm. right? Now you might like the sound of the inexpensive one. <laughs> if so, that's awesome. I don't. And that's my problem. That's my cross to bear. But is that universal? Pretty there, there, much. Are, there are no, there are no inexpensive symbols that are, that are, that provide sound that you would want. I mean, some companies, not universal guitars. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's some that you can get the decent sounds out of. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, yeah, it's not, it's not universal. No. Um, so with, with microphones, 
I don't know how I would feel about these mics in a live setting because I haven't tested them there. My guess is that I probably wouldn't be entirely happy with them in that, but I could be very wrong. It would be worth testing. And if I were doing this again today, I found while I was researching for Andy, I found that Monoprice has a very similar seven piece drum mic set. Now it's a little, it's a little more, it's, it's 139, not uh, 99. So, you know, we're, yeah. we're adding 40% to the price, <laughs> but it's still only 140 bucks. And it, they, yeah. these all come with a case or whatever. Monoprice has been a, a company that I've used on the tech side. Well, I've used them for microphone cables over the years and they're inexpensive and super reliable, like the most reliable I've ever found. On the tech side, Monoprice, like I have a Monoprice monitor uh, display here. What they, their MO is that they look at technology. They'll take like, what is the best 27 inch 4K display for computers? Okay. Dell makes, you know, if, if it's not the best one, it's a great one. What, and then they ask the question, what makes that the best? And they'll say, oh, it's the glass. Okay, great. What makes it expensive? Well, the glass is part of it, but you know, then Dell builds this really expensive casing and and you know, crazy super hoopty stand and all that other stuff and say, like, "Great. Let's take all that out. Let's get the glass because that's the part that matters to the end user 95% of the time mm. and we'll put a relatively inexpensive stand on it that's going to work just fine and let's sell it for half the price. Let's sell it for a third the price." And and my guess is I have not tested their drum mics, but my guess is that they went after their drum mics exactly the same way that they've gone after everything else that they've ever done where I've seen them like that. So I'm really curious to see how well their drum mics are and how the clamps are and all that. So I, I may, I I'm, I'm going to try and get a set of these two and, and, and mess with it. Cause that's what I would, if this were available the day that I were buying those piles or if maybe it was, and I just didn't know, but, um, but if I'd known about it, I would have, I would have bought, from Monoprice for, for that reason, just because I know how they approach things. It, otherwise, though, for somebody that's looking, if I were buying, now, I said there were two factors. There really is a third factor. When I'm showing up at a gig, if it's a fling gig, everybody on stage knows me. I don't have to worry about anything. I use the gear that I trust and they trust me and that's good. If I were showing up, though, for the first Uptown Celebration gig and they said, make sure you bring drum mics, I would not show up with Monoprice mics, mm -hmm. right? Because that's a bad look. And as even if the mics that I brought sounded just as good as, you know, the, the name brand mics, this is a high profile gig, high paying gig. You know, what are we getting ourselves into with this guy? Now, today I would bring those because the sound guy and I really trust each other. You know, he knows that I, I wouldn't bring something that I hadn't that I didn't have confidence in. Right. And, and so, but, but there is something to be said for showing up with a set of like Audix or Sennheiser mics, because that's going to make a difference for you. And, and in, in those scenarios, Audix has two that I would look at their FP five is three forty nine, and it's a budget set. And their DP five is the not budget set. It's, it's a five microphone set for 700 bucks. The Audix mics, they are roadworthy, they sound great. They do have their own um, e e EQ, their own sound signature, uh, which which is a great one and really works well live. So you don't have to fight with it a whole lot to get it to just sound like what you want it to sound like through a PA. And so I, I would lean toward Audix or the Sennheiser E600. Now, that set of drum mics is a thousand bucks probably more than, than what, um, Andy's looking for in his budget, but I, we, that's what we use in Uptown Celebration and they're fantastic. So, um, so there you go. I, I will wrap this up because I've taken a long time on this one with the mixer. He had suggested a mixer, but it only had two XLR inputs. It was an eight channel mixer, but it only had two XLR inputs. You want to have an equal number of XLR inputs to microphones that you're going to plug in because you want to be able to control the gain of each channel. You can't just go XLR to quarter inch and hope that it works. It might, but you're probably buying problems by doing that. The um, He had suggested a Mackie uh, eight channel mixer. I would go with the Mackie Pro FX 10 V3. It's 230 bucks. It's got four XLR inputs. It's also got compression on two channels, which is a really handy thing for your kick drum. And it's got, in addition to EQ, effects, so you could add some reverb and everything and really give a nice submix of your drums, either in mono or stereo, and it's got XLR outs as well, so you can do, you can get yourself to the board any way that you need to. 
And so that's, that's what I would go with. Of course, links will, for all of these things are in the show notes, but uh, it was a fun little research project to do. So you gave, you gave him a very long, I'm sure a much more detailed answer than he thought you were, he was going to get. From <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes it makes sense to prep for the show. So it's well, worth putting in the time. And plus it's fun. So right. I didn't, I didn't mind doing this for Andy, even if we didn't cover it in the show. So that's cool. But yeah, it's interesting quality. wise like, like the, the, all the recordings that you've heard me do the, the, um, the one we did, the, the, the songs yep. with the Mac Macworld all-star band and the, the one I did for you with, um, dancing, dancing in the dark. In the dark. It's yeah. all been with these pile mics. The only th these I have uh, seven of these mics. The only thing that I'm not using from pile, I have a 57 on the top of the snare and I took the pile mic and I put it on the bottom of the snare. I, I because I the pile mics only had seven. And so I was like, well, I, I need to add one more. And so what am I going to do? So that's it. Um, but yeah, they, they sound really good, especially on my toms, which is quite frankly, a hard thing to get right. Tom's. It, you can really make Tom sound like cardboard if you have crummy mics on them or the wrong mics on them. And these, my Toms sing in these things. I really love them. So yeah, it's crazy. Great. hundred bucks. hundred bucks. That's a good deal. Yeah, yeah I know. All right. Yeah. Next for me. Yeah, man. You know, the, uh, the, the guitar pedal market is a crazy thing. It is, it is flooded. There are so many home business, boutique business, you know, big company, you know, Fender does pedals. Yeah. You know, th th there's so many approaches to pedals. I don't know. It's almost like, it's almost like the wine business. I mean, there's so many wineries out there. I don't know how they all make it, but, and they, they don't, I guess. And they, they, yeah. Many of them do yeah. not. That's correct. Right. Yeah. But there are so many pedal manufacturers. Uh, the boutique pedal market has really exploded. And there's some that have risen, I, th I would say kind of to the top in terms of reputation for, you know, quality innovation, you know, just, yeah, really solid, great pedals. Strymon is one of those companies, uh, and uh, I believe they're a German company. I have had their Leslie simulator on my pedal board, and it is awesome. It's just such a, um, it's such a different sound. I use it mostly in in two solos during our a typical show. Okay, yeah, I was gonna ask you. I I have always. It, Trey Anastasio started playing with a Leslie, I don't know, was it 20 years ago or something. And anytime I see him go turn it on, I go, oh no. Like now we got to deal with 10 minutes, of, you know, guitar through a Leslie. I, it's not something I've ever seen anyone use with great effect. So I'm, I'm really, yeah, I was curious how, and it sounds like you use it very judiciously, which is probably the very point. Very couple solos. Yeah. No rhythm, just a couple solos. Yep. And, it's, and it's one of the very sparse um, backing uh, yeah. rhythm underneath it so it's just kind of effective although one song that i would love to pull out for that pedal alone is all the young girls love alice the the elton john song off a of goodbye yellow brick road you know that one? Oh, i don't know that i know that tune oh it, it it's just a great sounding guitar on that and he's playing through some kind of a leslie something yeah like interesting you should listen to that tune i'm it, putting it, it in the great tune. yeah i'm putting it in the uh in the thing yep all right great Anyway, uh, so Strymon is a great company, and their pedals are just really high-quality builds, and the sound is always terrific. But they have a pedal that dawns on me is, is something I think just about every guitar player should have, especially every gigging guitar player, right? Their pedal that's called the Iridium is an amp and, and cab simulator. So basically, if your amp dies in a gig, what are you going to do? Right? right? Some people bring a backup amp, but this is an amp and a pedal that you could patch out to, you know, uh, you know, a main or, you know, or, yeah. or, you know, go through a speaker. Anyway, it's three ninety nine. It gives you three different, um, uh, amp models. They don't call them out by name, but you can kind of guess where they are. Sure. Of and course. Three different cab simulations and then a whole bunch of controls. You know, so there's some EQ controls, um, a, a gain control and something called a room control, which I think is like a mic, um, a, a mic proximity control on it. Anyway, it, you know, I've played with tube amps by and large, and, you know, the possibility that that could hit a wall someday mm. on, on, a, on some gig, um, what would you do? And so I used to keep one of those um, simulation, um, uh, my, uh, you know, full pedal boards, yeah. you know, like a lot of switches on it. This is much simpler than that, but it'll get you through a gig until you can get your amp done. And it's, you know, from the videos that I've seen, it just really sounds great. One local guy up in the Bay Area, um, used one as his main rig and he always sounded great. So I think it just practically it it's smart to have something like that in your bag. Um, and then effectively, and again, this is a real quality company. Um, there's probably some cool sounds that you can get out of as well. Even if you just want it to be a pedal on your, on your, on your rig. 
Right. Uh, so Iridium by Strymon. By Strymon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I'm putting it on the uh, on the list. We got quite the list today. This is great. I love it. Absolutely. It's Gear happy, Fest. Happy, happy Christmas to us. Happy Christmas. <laughs> I know. Just looking at the list makes me happy, even if we don't actually get to have any of this stuff. <laughs> Uh, you want to take one more? Uh, I've got, I do have one more. In fact, I mean, I could keep going forever with this, but you know, I, I took up a lot of time with the, with the drum mic. So do you want to no, go ahead? Okay. More. So I have years and years ago, it might come as no surprise to people listening that I was, a. Uh, I grew up, I still am a big fan of Neil Peart's work. And, and when I was a teenager, you know, he was certainly my first big drum influence, uh, drumming influence. And he played these China cymbals that were, <laughs> this is the wrong year to talk about this. Uh, he played these China cymbals from the Wuhan province in China. And they were, you know, he talked, he like other people, other drummers had China cymbals and they sounded terrible. And Neil's Ch China cymbals had this like warm, buttery kind of sound to them. And everybody wondered, like, how are you getting that sound out of a China symbol when other people hit him? It sounds brash and like ugly. And yours are like the right kind of ugly. And he's like, oh, yeah, I, I made this trip to China and I went to this symbol factory in Wuhan and I, you know, I got a bunch of symbols from him and that's what I used. So at the time he was a Zildjian guy, you know, everything was Zildjian, 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 except his China symbols were not Zildjian. They were Wuhan China symbols. And I think when I was maybe 20, 19 or 20 years old, my local drum shop, uh, which was Brian Guitars in, in Connecticut, got a supply of Wuhan cymbals. And I bought one. I bought a 17-inch. I think it was a 17. It's either 17 or 18. I bought, it, bought one of these. And I still have it. Now, I've, you know, beat on this thing over the years. And it. I put a cymbal spring on it right away, which for any drummer using a China cymbal, do that. Because otherwise, you'll, you'll just break these things right out of the gate. You want to have some flex. Uh, available to it, but I put a cymbal spring on it right away. And I think I paid like 50 bucks for the cymbal. I mean, it was cheap. I want to get another one. It's time, right? It, this has a, there's a couple little cracks in it that I've drilled to keep them from, from growing. It doesn't, the sound is still just as good as, it, as it's ever been, but I, I want to get another one. And I've been thinking, do I get another Wuhan cymbal? Now in the, in the intervening years, the Wuhan cymbal factory has become a, like an actual going concern and you can even buy Wuhan cymbals on Amazon. And the best part about them is they're still really cheap. Like you can buy them for like 75 bucks or 80 bucks for a Wuhan cymbal on Amazon. But I've been thinking, do I get a Wuhan or do I look at, you know, I started looking, well, would pasty make a decent China symbol? Cause they have that, that similar kind of warm sound and they do in listening to, you know, their listening room online, the pasty signature thin China, 16 inch sounds like what I would want. But of course the thing is it's, it's $384. Whereas, you know, the Wuhan is, is in that, that, that Dave really likes sub hundred dollar price range. So my guess is I'm just going to buy another Wuhan, but, um, but I'm, I'm looking at the pasty. So there you go. Very cool. <laughs> yep. So to answer your question from before, no, it's not universal. You can get cheap symbols that sound good. good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, Merry Christmas to us, man. That's a good list. It's a good list. Yeah. I hope, I hope Santa finds his way to your house. I do too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, um, we'll make sure to, uh, we'll leave the light on for him. I think that's happy holidays. The, happy holidays. There it is. That's right. Yeah. You've got, you've got family home for the holidays, which is great, man. Yeah. I'm just so happy. My uh, oldest daughter made it back. Here she drove across country. She left the day before Thanksgiving. Wow. Didn't want to fly, so she, they, her and her husband drove. They got here last night, so our house is going to start filling up with people again, which is really fun. And we're, you know, in this stay-at-home order now, so our bubble is going to be our house. And we kind of yep. talked through the process of getting people sucked into our bubble, and <laughs> and uh, but. You know, better to bubble with those you love, right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, we're, we're I mean, we're not in, we're certainly not in the same order that you are, but I mean, effectively, that's kind of how we live here anyway. It's, there's not anywhere to go that we feel safe doing. It's certainly not indoors anywhere and it's really cold to, to not be indoors. So yeah, we're, we're kind of in the same thing, but we've got the two kids home for, you know, another month and a half. So that's um, it's good. That, like we started talking about the last couple episodes, the conversation is starting to shift towards the light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, so just reminding everybody, if you haven't listened to the last episode where we talked about, you know, it's time to start making the plans of reaching out, just establishing contact with the people that you're going to book with 
and just say, hey, you know, if things open up, you know, what are you thinking? You know, you want to put anything on the calendar, you know, tentatively or, you know, anything yeah. can change. Those conversations are, I, we, we talked about that quite a bit in the last episode and I thought it was a really helpful conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It, it helped. It helped me too. It's like, right. We can, we can have this, we can put these things on the calendar. And if, if either party is unsafe or feeling unsafe about it as the, as the date approaches, well, then you just undo it. It's fine. Yep. You know, and assume, and my guess is that there will be a level of understanding that has not existed previously. You know, we talked about over the summer I had a gig I needed to cancel because of the place was, you know, having some outbreak or whatever. And, you know, the booking agent was like, this, this, this is not a strike against you. <laughs> you know, like I get it. I was like, okay, good. Right. So yeah. Yep. People seem to be, there's a lot. I, I am certainly finding this for myself. Perhaps I'm projecting it onto others, but I'm, I've certainly learned a lot more compassion, uh, during this and tolerance. And even if it's not my first reaction, it's a very quick second reaction. Like, wait, 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 slow down. It's a pandemic, you know, yeah. like everybody's walking their own path. Just l l l listen to that person again, you know, <laughs> re reevaluate, re unentrench, reevaluate. So, yeah, no, yeah. I agree. Yeah. You know, yeah. your, your view of the world and what makes the world work and our, extremely temporary place on it, you know, it has a, has a different meaning as we've lived through this. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, that's, uh, that's what we got for today. Uh, thanks for, thanks for listening. Send in your stuff though. Like if you have, you know, questions, certainly gear recommendations, gear desires, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We want to hear about it. We want to share it. It's part of what Always we do. For me. Always.